One of your summer assignments was to read chapter 11, which deals with intelligence. We're going to break it down into three parts to look at it. Today, our video is going to look at defining intelligence and the different theories of intelligence. The College Board objectives are listed here, so just defining, um, thinking about how culture might influence the definition, and then uh, more importantly, being able to compare and contrast the different theories and identify those key contributors. So not just the theories, but the people who put forth those theories. Intelligence is challenging to define because what we're trying to do is we're trying to reify intelligence, meaning we're trying to take something that's abstract and treat it as if it were a concrete thing. And intelligence is not necessarily a concrete thing. We try to make it that way. We try to create tests so that we can figure out what kind of ACT score, or SAT score um, you're going to get and whether or not that test will predict your success at the college level and all of those different things that we do. Yet intelligence is a very abstract thing. So right now, we're agreeing to define it as the ability to learn from experience, solve problems, and use knowledge to adapt to new situations. With this basic definition, we might agree that we're all intelligent, I hope. Um, so what does that mean? That makes me think of the kid in class with the cell phone, um, that kid who brings out his cell phone every single day and continues to get in trouble from a teacher because they're in the back texting or looking at Twitter or Facebook or watching videos or whatever it is that you guys do, um, versus the kid who gets in trouble once or twice and says to himself or herself, okay, I really want to look at my Twitter but I'm in class, I'm going to get in trouble. Oh, I'll ask for the hall pass. Um, so what did you do there? You learned from your experience of getting in trouble, but to solve that problem of needing to be on your phone, you choose to grab the pass and go walk around. Um, you use that knowledge to adapt to new situations. Then with every new teacher, with every new class, you learn their policy for cell phones and you adjust your behavior accordingly so that you don't get in trouble. If you do that, then you would be intelligent, correct? Um, but the question is, if you don't do that, does that make you unintelligent? So what does this definition really mean? Um, different theorists propose different ideas. Some say that intelligence is one, one thing in general, whereas others say, no, it's a bunch of things, but we can kind of name them. They're more specific. So that's the ongoing debate. We're going to look first at the ideas of general ability. And Charles Spearman is the first guy that we're going to look at, and he says that there is an overall general intelligence, which we refer to as the G factor. Um, he says that we have specific abilities like verbal and mathematical aptitudes, so things that we can potentially um, achieve. And he used a process known as factor analysis, which is just a statistical procedure um, for paring down items that tend to occur together. So he used factor analysis and said that there are lots of clusters of mental abilities like verbal and spatial and reasoning and all of those things, um, but there tends to be um, a tendency for those who excel in one of those clusters to score well in other clusters as well. So in his research, he says, well, if somebody tends to be good in one area, then they're probably going to be decent in other areas as well. So as one factor increases, so do others. So that is his overall general intelligence. Um, he made a comparison, or they make a comparison to athleticism in the textbook, which you can look at. So it talks about, you know, somebody who's athletic, so maybe they're a really fast runner. Um, does that mean that they're going to be really great at everything else? No, they might not be a great swimmer or a great gymnast or a great football player, but they do tend to have those athletic abilities like um, they're good on their, on their feet or they maintain balance well or um, their body posture. All of those different things um, tend to occur together, even though they excel in one area um, specifically. So Thurston, L.L. Thurston, decided to kind of challenge Spearman. He was the first challenge to Spear, and he came up with a counter argument. And um, what he did was he ranked people's primary mental abilities, and he basically said that um, we have different clusters. He, he came up with seven different clusters of intelligence and said that instead of there being one common skill set or one G factor that underlies all intelligent behavior, um, instead he said that these seven clusters kind of occurred together, so you could excel in a cluster. 
Um, as we continue on, then, we look at theories of multiple intelligence, which tend to be pretty popular today, um, especially multiple intelligence, as this is what many teachers are trained in today. Howard Gardner is known for the theory of multiple intelligences, where he came up with eight specific intelligence areas. And what he did is he said that people with brain damage, for example, they might really struggle um, with one or two things, yet they still are able to do all of the other things that they did before. Or he looked at um, savant syndrome, for example, and savant syndrome is um, where we would struggle with social or verbal cues or things like that. So we definitely struggle um, with different areas that we would call intelligent, yet um, with savant syndrome, you would have an extreme capacity, usually in mathematics or numbers or dates or something like that. So are you unintelligent with savant syndrome? No, you're off the charts in that mathematical or that date or number area. It's just that in all of those other areas, you have an extremely diminished capacity. So um, Gardner's work is, I think, really interesting because it shows that people can be intelligent in all different ways. So as you can see listed here, linguistic, that would be um, verbal or writing. You might write really well. You like to read. You like to speak. All of those things you might be good at. Logical, mathematical, you might be good at numbers, math class, science, um, logic. Logic can even be, you know, being a lawyer or something like that, being able to really think through problems. Musical is musical, right? You might compose. You might learn better by putting things into beats or things like that. Spatial, um, obviously we think of artistic abilities, so our drawers and painters, but you should also think of spatial as maybe interior design or something like that, where you can walk into an apartment, you can see exactly how it should be laid out. Um, bodily kinesthetic then, those would be our athletes or our dancers. This means that you have control over your body, um, you're, good on your hand, you're good with your hands, you're good on your feet. Um, you might like to act things out to learn. That might help you to do things um, in order to learn it rather than to just listen to things. Intrapersonal is um, a strong understanding of yourself, an ability to understand yourself. Also maybe an ability to understand others, but intrapersonal means um, that you are within. So you might be highly analytical of yourself. Interpersonal then means that you, you have strong interactions with other people. So you're good at speaking to people. You're good at reading people. Um, and that would really help you, obviously, in a variety of areas in life. It helps you be a leader. Naturalist intelligence is the most recent one that he's added to the list then. Um, we think of Charles Darwin. We think of anything um, that is sort of environmental or tied up in nature. So those are our different areas of intelligences with Howard Gardner. And again, he says, you might not be good in all of these areas. You might be really good in one. Um, you might be really good in one or two, and then you might be weak in a few others. The next one then is um, Sternberg, and he came up with the triarchic theory of intelligences. He says that, yes, there are multiple intelligences, but instead of the eight that Gardner talks about, he talks about three. He says that they're analytical, creative, and practical. Analytical would be our academic problem-solving one. This is the one that we see on intelligence tests. We give you um, a problem with one right answer, and you're able to, to figure out that right answer. These tests tend to predict our school grades um, and maybe even some of your success in the world of work. Creative intelligence, then, is demonstrated in reacting adaptively to new situations and being able to come up with your own new ideas. Practical intelligence is what we call um, everyday tasks, so your ability to manage your time well, um, to maybe to manage other people, and things like that. So it depends less on academic problem-solving skills um, and relies more on an ability to manage yourself and others. So you can see how all three of these types of intelligence would also be really important in life. It's not just about academic intelligence. So comparing the theories of intelligence then, remember we have Spearman and the G-factor. That's one basic intelligence that predicts our abilities in a variety of different areas. Thurston says that we have primary mental abilities, so our intelligence is broken down into seven different factors or clusters. Um, Gardner with his multiple intelligences, where he says there are eight independent intelligences. 
um, which goes which go far beyond school intelligence, and then Sternberg's triarchic, which says that there are three different areas that can predict our real world success. One more thing to look at then is should we differentiate academic intelligence and social intelligence? And one type of social intelligence that's received um, a lot of research and a lot of funding and a lot of hype lately is emotional intelligence. And that's the ability to perceive, understand, and manage emotions, as well as use those emotions for adaptive or creative thinking. We know people who are emotionally intelligent. You might be one of them. You can kind of sense when something's wrong with somebody or with yourself. You can understand why it might be wrong um, you, or why that thing might be going wrong. You don't fly off the handle um, in terms of managing your emotions. So thinking about people who are highly emotionally intelligent, um, those are the people who might be some of your best friends or um, maybe decent teachers or a parent or whatever it might be. Um, lots of different businesses actually are working on emotional intelligence um, with their employees right now. So a quick check of where we're at. Which of the following does Robert Sternberg include as a type of intelligence? So go ahead and pick your answer to that. And then savant syndrome lends support to which theory of intelligence? And then some people appear to be self-aware, manage conflicts well, and generally seem to be well-equipped to handle most social and emotional situations very well. What type of intelligence does this seem to reflect? Charles Spearman's G refers to And then in summary, the biggest question to ask yourself at this point is, do I understand each of the theories well enough to be able to compare and contrast them? What similarities and differences exist between the four main theories that we just talked about? If you can answer this, then you're ready to move on. If you can't, you definitely want to go back and reread the pages in the book.